if we could establish or reestablish some level of trust between healthcare professionals and pharma, pharma has a lot to offer. Um, I'm trying to think of some other really cool questions. Um, I can tell you I'm relieved to hear that the doctor's first concern was the outcomes. Yeah. I, I think Pharma was really surprised. I think Pharma expected... Pharma was surprised. That, <laughs> Pharma was surprised because they expected that everything would be like cut and dry. Like, most of the questions that you... Most of the questions that a doctor has about a drug, they can reach with a pharmacist on staff. But pharmacists still are the point of contact between the drug industry and the institution. And there's a lot of questions that pharmacists have that are not cut and dry. And we captured a lot of those questions just about, um, uh, we captured more questions from generalist pharmacists than specialty pharmacists. pharmacists. So we were, we were a little bit surprised by that. But when we interviewed the specialty pharmacists, we found that most of them had on their speed dials uh, the medical liaisons of the companies that, you know, so if you're a cardiologist <laughs> pharmacist on the cardiology unit, five companies, main companies, you have those medical liaisons on your speed dial. Again, got us thinking, how do we use technology to connect every single healthcare professional, whether it's a GP in the outpatient setting or a specialist with the brightest mind in pharma to get their expert question answered. And what are the, let's get back to adherence now. Adherence, obviously for the patient, has a huge value. Yeah. For the provider, um, let's assume that they are indeed really focused on outcomes and therefore it has huge value. For the pharma company, it's really their bottom line. If patients aren't filling prescriptions, the pharmacies aren't getting the pharmaceuticals aren't getting sold. Where where is their outlook on this issue of adherence? Uh, so, the story that I like to tell is like if, if it's 1970 and you are opening an organic market, do you go to Ames, Iowa, or do you go to Berkeley, California? We're dealing with the most progressive pharma companies right now, and just in the past several months, we found that Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, along with Pfizer and Novartis, appear to be very, very progressive in understanding that the entire healthcare economy has changed. It used to be, uh, as someone said here, take this pill, call me in the morning. It's not that anymore. You've got institutions that are integrating genomics testing and proteomics testing. You've got all of these diagnostics. These capital expenditures are affecting which drugs can be prescribed, which drugs can be tested for, um, Pharma is going to have to embrace the outcomes. The outcomes can be adherence, but a lot of the outcomes in the institution um, have to do with, you know, as we're reinventing this protocol, how should we do it? How do we safeguard ourselves against m making a decision now that we'll pay for in five years because, you know, two systems <coughs> talk to each other. Um, but in, in terms of adherence, I mean, that's, that's very much on the individual level. Yes, I mean, the providers asked a lot of questions about uh, pill boxes and reminders, um, apps. Uh, pharma is really interesting right now. Pharma is, uh, I, I think you're going to see pharma go on a <coughs> buying spree with apps very soon because to your point about behavior change and to your point back there, um, there's a lot of game mechanics that can be used to inspire individual behavior change, right? To your point, uh, Gil, we're all motivated by different things. We always have these phones, these, these tablets on us. Um, pharma, as we're talking, uh, they're getting very interested in what's going to be the combination of app plus drug in the future so that they can play their role in helping the patient actually adhere, connect the patient to a social network of other patients that are going through the same thing that they're going through, and also connect that patient to a medical expert that may be able to answer a question about side effects. Um, I just want to add one more thing. Um, there's a company in New York called Haptique. Uh, they are curating the first dedicated medical app marketplace. And they're going to a bunch of hospitals in New York. They're startup too. And they're saying, look, the way that you manage drug formularies today, you're going to manage app formularies very soon. Patients are already asking doctors and pharmacists, which app should I use for weight loss or psychiatry or smoking cessation? What do you recommend? What are the standards? I mean, the FDA has said that for the vast majority of apps that don't involve diagnosis, they're not going to even evaluate them. That's 80% plus. They're only going to evaluate the ones that involve diagnosis. So how are you as providers going to choose? How are you going to get your questions answered about the various, um, uh, the various uh, evaluation standards? 
on the apps, and, and how are you going to make uh, an, an informed suggestion to your patient? Um, I would predict you guys are going to see a lot more integration with pharma plus app, the drug plus the app, to help the patient be adherent and manage side effects. Um, let me do a, a little change of uh, change of topic over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if it's uh, yeah. can, can we come back to it in a minute? Sure. And then, yeah. uh, let, let me. Uh, uh, there were a couple of things I wanted to cover, and then I will definitely open it up to everybody in the audience. Here. So, uh, just one other thing I want to touch on uh, for all of you, but but particularly for Rashawn Gill and then uh, Nancy also. Uh, although I'm imagining I know the answer for Nancy, but maybe I don't. Is for a lot of <laughs> for a lot of revolutionary technologies, uh, how do you what, what's your business model? Who's going to buy and why are they going to pay? For it? And and how are you going to get it out there and deploy it to scale? I'll answer ours quickly. Uh, Pharma spends fifty million dollars on salespeople that most of you in the room aren't really meeting with. Uh, they are losing patents on big blockbuster drugs. The new drugs that are emerging tend to be niche drugs that are not going to require large sales forces. Technology offers the ability for you as a provider to connect with an expert in pharma without meeting them in person through your tablet or your iPhone or whatever app you're using. So the providers have a subscription to this? or No, pharma fully funds it. Pharma funds it. Because and it's, a, it's a net savings for right. them over right. deploying. They're in the marketplace, fund. basically. So the providers shouldn't have to pay for getting the most up-to-date information from the drug companies when all of these experts, your peers, are in the drug companies. How about so, you, Well, we have one uh, business development person who is dealing with uh, pharmacies uh, and drug companies. Another with insurers, and our CEO is out meeting uh, retailers, and we'll see who wins. Unholy alliance there, you know, um, pharma companies. We may have to go with papers. whoever chooses us first. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a lot of people who have a stake in adherence and more broadly in outcomes, keeping people alive out of the hospital, reducing medical care, and some of them are having to change their own models about what they pay for and how. So there's certainly a, um, a back pressure of a problem that needs a solution and figuring out exactly how it's going to be monetized, whether it's a uh, direct sale of software or a per user fee or a license or even a um, sponsorship situation. Uh, we're working that out, but we're contemplating charging um, people who have a really well-defined um, cost uh, issue, savings or money to be made, um, a subscription fee per patient uh, that's based on the return to them that we can prove. So this would be, um, when you say per patient, that is, therefore it's probably now not a provider, right? You're talking payer, you're talking... Yes, most likely payer. I mean, it's hard to figure out who the payer oh, is, is okay. because so you, you're, you pay your insurance company, I pay you. So if I may summarize, you will build it and they will come. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to be so harsh, but... but they will uh, talk. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to pass it to Nancy, a quick chance to answer, and then um, Scarlett, maybe you, you can also tell us a little bit about the financial challenges here, but Nancy first. So we have a couple mechanisms. We are launching our first product at the end of this year in the UK, and the model for that will be uh, basically people in the UK can go to their pharmacy, and when they get their prescriptions, they can choose to get the prescription Proteus pack, which will have patches and will have our enabled pills in there. And uh, there will be a subscription fee, the consumer will pay it, we're not going through insurance or anything. Uh, the philosophy behind that is we're providing a valuable customer service, and if we make it good, people will pay for it. It's targeting uh, people uh, who are managing chronic diseases, both so they can manage their data and they can share it with their caretakers or doctors or other people who might be interested to kind of relieve that, that burden of making sure that they're okay, helping people live independently. So, so they get the Proteus embedded pill with the regular prescription and they pay for the patches. Yeah. So let me challenge that a bit to what, or, or answer that. If people already have trouble just buying pills, what do you think they're going to do with patches on top of it? Yeah, exactly. You know, How much is it yeah so this model does require a certain amount of engagement to begin with, and it's what we're launching with first. It, we're not sure if it's perfect or not yet, we'll find out. We are going down other avenues as well. We have partner, uh, partnerships with pharma companies because they're interested in this technology, you know, the ones who embrace the fact that the traditional model won't continue to work forever. You can't stop technology, things are going to change. 
Uh, we're also in the consumer space. Uh, we're licensing our technology to body media. So from a strictly consumer uh, sort of fitness market, we're looking at that as well. We're, uh, we're making money on the narcissistic hardware. ones who want to know everything about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, the ones ahead of the curve. <laughs> but, but financially, I mean, if I may extrapolate a little bit from what both of you said and certainly what Roshan said, all, all roads are leading back to pharma, basically. I wouldn't necessarily say it all has to come from pharma. I mean, one of the big things is there's a huge, you know, multi-billion dollar problem that we can try to solve preventatively with a lot of these systems. And if it's costing all this money, it means there's money in preventing it. So no one, it's everyone's problem, it's no one's problem. I mean, that's where we're, it's the tragedy of the commons, right? That's where we are. I mean, we'd all be better off if everyone took their meds, right? But there's a, but there's a big role for mayors as well. And even some self-insured employers, you know, Safeway is famous for its various programs. But, but there you have the tension, you know, uh, what's good for pharma is not good for payers. So, mm -hmm. there, you, you, you got to decide which side you're going to play on. I mean, you can't be on both teams. What do you think about that? I kind of feel like there's, Pay for -use. this kind of goes into the, the overarching, like, do you want to make money or do you want to be altruistic? And I think there are paths to align those two goals, to make the altruistic goals match up with the goals that will make you money. And making people healthier is one of those... I can tell what decade you were born in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so, sorry. Was the traffic on the way? So... <laughs> Scarlett, can you tell us a little about the financial uh, financial incentives here and how they stacked up and what it took to make that kind of investment in the, in the new technology, in the 21st century technology for pharma? For I mean, sorry, I meant Scarlett. For Did pharma? You mean? Yeah, your whole system mine, and the, what were some of the issues there? For, okay. It was a lot of money, I'll say that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I will tell you, um, building it in a new space, I was able to do it for a lot less with, and bring in a lot more equipment than if I try to remodel an old building. So that was nice. Um, the, the how we did it brought this in because I mean it's well, well I, it's out in the public. It's, we spent fifteen million dollars putting this pharmacy together. Um, I sold it to the C the C suite. I I will save that much money on basically one lawsuit by avoiding one lawsuit. Which is probably what it does, you know. Um, we didn't try to sell it on less staff because, believe me, it doesn't take less staff. <laughs> they asked me about the the IV robot. What could I do to improve it? Well, have the robot actually go over to the box picker, get the drug out, stock itself, come back, and then when it needs to be clean, clean itself. Because I still have to have people to do all those parts. Um, it's 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 not self sufficient. Um, but to caveat on the comment of, sorry to say, that it, you're going after the consumer, that does concern me because a lot of the problem, I work also at retail pharmacy for friends in my hometown down south, and the biggest problem we have is people can't afford their meds. Insurance companies are paying less and less, but I think if we could show insurance companies or provider that that avenue if we can show, or you could find out whether or not these people are actually taking their meds, and if they're not taking their meds, then maybe their insurance rates are different, you know, the tiered kind of insurance plan, it would be more incentive for patients to do it. I, that might be a... An it's like your driver's time. record, okay? So people yeah. have a pill-taking record, and if you're, you've got more than so many points, then well, you know, insurance, insurance rates well, go insurance down. companies have said this for years. Yeah. If you don't, if you're not a healthy person, you're obese and you fall in all these other lines, your insurance rate should probably be higher than someone who's healthy, fit, and everything else. Now, does that mean yes or no? Is it really right? But the statistics are there, so. Yeah. That gentleman in the back has his right. hand up all <laughs> so day. Right. Let's, let's start. There you go. So I was actually going to bring up the insurance issue. So how many people in this room are self-insured or don't have insurance? Self-insured or have it or don't have insurance. Self-insurance is basically you have to pay for yourself and you die, right? So it's 30 to 40 percent of the time. So I was going to say that I think we're missing one of the points of adherence is one, most people don't know why they should be here. I know a doctor who 
takes her, and we won't mention names, but who takes her hypertension medicine when she starts to feel headaches. And that's a doctor, yeah. right? That's yeah. a doctor. Those, they're so, just that's about, not that I'm just, <laughs> physicians, <laughs> okay. sorry physicians, but I work with all of you and I love you all, but you, they are the worst for taking their medications. Uh, I'm just they really saying, are. So. You know, knowledge, whatever reasons you want to put in all this, <laughs> There are people who are 100% knowledgeable that, as I said, I personally have somebody in my household in the position who I remind them every day to take their hypertension medicine because otherwise you get headaches in three or four days, right? Um, the second question is, it's an economic component, which is what you're talking about, because the fact of the matter is they just recently did a study on seniors where the donut that, we won't mention any political parties, the Republicans put in, um, that basically means that anybody who hits the donut, you know, is that pays for the first 1500 doesn't pay for the next 3000 pharmaceuticals, and then picks it up again at $5,000, means that when they hit the hole, they stop being adherent because it's a choice between eating and paying $100 a month in medications, it becomes a huge factor in the decision making as to what you decide to do and how you take care of yourself. Once you start adding three, four, or five meds to the process, it really becomes a, a a function of these issues. So I just I guess my question is how much have you guys thought about policy, behavior, and socioeconomic factors in all of these discussions? Because I would I would tell you that a, a big function isn't just whether or not to mention your house or what you feel like doing, but but again, how whether I can afford the drugs, you know, what is it what is the what is the impact, for example, on health insurance companies of poor adherence versus bad adherence in terms of avoiding hospital cases? Because Gita, you mentioned there's a tension between payers and, and physicians, but, the, they, but they've shown that if you take the pill, it's still cheaper for an insurance company for them to pay for the pills than it is for you to go and have surgery or take care of, right? Right. So, so this is this is sort of a, a social question, and it's always hard for entrepreneurs to, uh, despite what Nancy said, it's hard for entrepreneurs to, or any company, any one company to.